Welcome to the third installment of Business Skills for Musicians. This is my series, teaching producers, musicians, songwriters, how to navigate the waters of business, specifically through the music licensing industry. So we've had some great uh, presentations already and we're continuing on today with killer communication skills, okay? Th these are some of the things that it's a little bit common sense, but again, we do need to teach these things and we do need to make sure that we are aware of how to directly and effectively communicate. This is a people business. The music licensing industry does not work unless you are willing to work with people. And that means if there's people involved, there's a lot of communication happening on both ends. And so you need to make sure that you're clear, you're effective, and you're being very direct, okay? So if you're a clear and great communicator, and you got great music and you're a hard worker, a music library or a supervisor will never let you go. They're gonna hold on to you with both arms and beg you to continue to supply them with music because it's such a rare thing to find these days and probably ever in history, artists and, and sort of the uh, creative types that also have a good foundation of business skills and they have their feet on their ground. They can kind of uh, sort of turn off the artistry, the artist uh, persona, the diva a bit and plug into a little bit of a business mindset when it comes to negotiating and supplying the needs of a client that you're that you're working with, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's gonna to be a little bit different than the previous presentations that we've done. It's gonna be fun, actually. I think you're gonna like it. So let's get started here. Um, again, as I said before, music licensing is a team sport, and almost everything else as well in the music business is a team sport. So if you're not willing to work with others, this is just not gonna work out for you. I had to get over this when I first got into the licensing business. I did not want to give up any rights, any back end, any publishing, copyrights. I was very focused on, I want to hold on to 100% of what I had created. Now you can do that, but understand that unless you have a direct outlet to get your music licensed, you'll be holding on to 100% of zero, of nothing, okay? It's better to take 50% of a bigger pie than keep 100% of nothing. At least that's my philosophy. I think you would agree with me. You got to be willing to work with others, enable them. And but what you do is basically when you when you work with others and you sort of allow them to take a piece of your back end, your publishing money, you know, whatever it is, that you are enabling other people to work for you, to be self enabled, to be motivated, to be encouraged, to go do the work for you while you're not even in front of your computer while you're sleeping. You can literally have people around the world as I do, shopping your music all over the place because they earn something by doing that, right? So a big uh, mind shift change that helped me get through this process was thinking people are not stealing from you when they take some of your publishing or maybe even all of your publishing, but you retain your writer share. What they're doing is they're incentivizing themselves to go shop your music and to make them some money, but the only way they make themselves money is by making you money. What better situation could there be, right? So if you can... Get over the hurdle of, oh, I don't, I've, I've always been told, never give up your publishing, never give up your copyrights. I understand that, but you gotta understand that a lot of that advice that was handed out was really more about the record business, about record labels doing these 360 deals where they're taking a piece of everything that you possibly can do. The licensing business is much more uh, fractionalized and, and much more segmented in that you're only signing over specific songs to a library. They're not signing you as an artist. They don't own you for seven albums or anything like that. Those aren't, those aren't the kind of deals that get made in this business. So if you can think of it more as a partnership where you own, you're the owner of these songs and they own their library and you're basically just having a strategic partnership between two businesses to get music placed and to earn both of you money, you kind of can get, you can rise above where most producers' heads are. Most producers are still stuck in the weeds of like, well, I'm not gonna give up anything. Okay, take your ball and go home and earn nothing. But those of us that are willing to play ball and want to enable others to make us rich, we will be the ones getting the placements and getting the royalty checks. Know that everyone, everyone has a personal incentive and the world is not spinning around you, okay? So always just keep that in the back of your head when you're communicating and when you're getting involved in this business that a library has an incentive, a supervisor has an incentive, uh, a trailer house, an ad agency. You have personal incentives. And guess what everybody's incentive is? It's all the same. Everybody wants as much as they possibly can get for themselves while giving up as little as possible. That is the human condition that we are in. We all want the most amount of rewards for the least amount of effort. It is just built into our DNA. It's built into our survival uh, mechanisms, right, from eons ago. 
So just always be aware of that, that it's not just about you. It's not just about what you want, but you also need to keep in mind, especially when you're negotiating and approaching a library, what's in it for them? What would they want out of me? When you can do that, when you can take out your sort of filters on reality and plug into maybe thinking about what would they be thinking when they're coming at me, you will have a superpower that most producers and musicians have, they, they don't have anything close to that, okay? That will put you on a much higher playing field competitively if you can start putting yourself in the shoes of those that you're gonna do business with, because then you can start anticipating what they want, what their needs are, maybe what their negotiating tactic would be, so you can have the edge on them, okay? Um, I, as I just said, you know, just being able to get out of your own perspective on what you want and what's in it for you is a golden skill to have. It's gonna really set you apart. Um, some of the biggest issues that happen in communication, at least that I've seen being 10 years into this business, um, is producers that are delivering excuses, disclaimers. A disclaimer would be, oh, this track isn't mixed yet, but you know, uh, it, it's got potential, right? And you're sending me basically um, something that's not ready to go or a library, something that's not ready to be licensed. Rather than sending them a, a fully completed, mixed and mastered, beautiful piece of music, you're sending them a disclaimer, which is not really that useful, right? Reasons. Uh, giving people homework assignments, uh, telling them like, oh, click this link and then click that link and then download this. And having people jump through hoops to get to your music or to get to whatever it is you want them to check out, not a good thing to be doing, okay? Uh, you should only be delivering results. That's the why it's the only word in that sentence that's capitalized only should be delivering results. You should be delivering finalized tracks. You should be delivering a contract if they've asked for it or an answer or a clarification. Always come to the table with results, not problems, not excuses, not any of this stuff, okay? That's one of the big things that grinds my gears for sure. And I know for a lot of music libraries, they get a lot of this as well. Um, and if you're only giving them answers, results, solutions, that's when they're gonna hold on to you. And that's when you're gonna become part of their inner circle. Um, being passive aggressive instead of assertive, okay? It doesn't mean you're being aggressive. I don't think you should be aggressive, but assertive is just saying directly, stating plainly what it is you want, what it is that you're needing, what it is you're in search of, rather than sort of passive aggressively hinting at what you might want, or if you're not getting what you want, rather than just telling them, hey guys, I'm not happy, uh, I would like to have this, I'd like to have that you sort of start kicking up attitude a little bit with your partners or with your libraries that you're working with. You sort of are slow to respond to their emails or their phone calls because you're like, yeah, screw you guys. I don't really want to work with you. But you're not directly just telling them, hey, I've lost a little bit of confidence or I'd like to see a couple of things happen before I start getting more active with you again. Being passive aggressive is a loser mentality. It's a loser way to go. It's not effective. Just be assertive. Just tell people directly what you want, what you, what's bothering you. It's so much more powerful to get what you want out of not just this industry, but life in general with all relationships that you have, personal, business, everything. Being passive aggressive is, I can't stand, that's probably one of the worst things, one of my biggest pet peeves when I, when I get passive aggressiveness, it bothers me to no end, I hate it. I'd rather be rudely confronted by somebody who says, Jesse, you know, you're full of it, I don't like you. I'd rather get that than sort of a wormy, wiggly, kind of passive aggressive attitude from somebody. Um, I, I would rather be confronted directly, and I don't know, that's just maybe my style, but I think most people do appreciate honesty and they do appreciate just assertiveness, not aggressiveness though, okay? Over communicating, okay? Giving way too many details, sharing all the intimate details of your life, of your history, of what's happening to you. What, you know, you, you had a tech, we'll, we'll talk about this in the future, but you know, if you had a tech support uh, issue and you start emailing your library directly and telling them like, hey, you know, I'm having all these issues and here's what they told me, you're, you only need to be communicating when it's gonna be useful for your library partners or for your music supervisors, okay? So don't just check in with them all the time, like, hey, how you just wanted to check in, see how you're doing, no. We are here for business. We are here to make sure that we are supplying each other with what we need, okay? So you need to be always serving people and by over communicating, sending also extremely long emails or calling constantly, no. That, that is not useful and you're gonna start bugging people that you work with Keep it to a minimum. And in fact, if you have one question and it can wait for a week or two, wait for a week or two because maybe other questions might pile up and you can basically send one email that has all of your issues in one. I try to, when I'm communicating with my libraries, I'm always thinking before I hit send, is there anything else that I need to get from them in, in this one email? I do not want to send them, hey, here's the links you wanted, here's some questions I have, here's, and having all these different emails coming at them, one email. It should have everything and very clearly listed in an email, okay? 
So here's where this presentation is going to be a little bit different. Usually I have a whole you know, uh, PowerPoint here where it's going through all of the points, but rather than going through them uh, the way that we usually do in these presentations, I want to just do it in a quiz format. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a few situations that definitely happen in this business and happen way more often than you probably realize. And we are going to just test what you think you should do in each of these scenarios and there will be one right answer. So as you follow along, play along and select your answer and then at the end of the question when I go through all the options, it's like a five multiple choice option, you tell me or you, I can't hear you obviously, but you decide which one you feel is the right answer and then I'll reveal which one it is. So it'll be a lot of fun. You can kind of see maybe where your instincts might have driven you the wrong way or hopefully the right way or no matter what, you're gonna know the right way after this presentation. So here's the first scenario. You are submitting to a new music library for consideration. So brand new, you don't work with them yet, you're just putting your first couple tracks out there. Which of the following should be your main objective with your submission? So when you're sending that email, what should be you, you really be driving home when you craft that submission email to this company? To share your personal background and accomplishments to impress a library CEO, right? To let them know what you've been working on, how long you've been working on it, to really highlight your history and where you've been in this business, or maybe you're not in this business yet, but you've had experience elsewhere, just really highlighting who you are and where you come from. Uh, to demonstrate your understanding of the licensing business so the library knows you're uh, a professional. Okay, so basically listing out that you understand about publishing and writers, you understand registrations, you understand the structure of the industry, you're not new to it, or at least you've, you've taken a course, so you understand something about the business so you know they know you're not some newbie just off the streets, right? to submit a wide variety of musical styles to demonstrate your versatility, right? So just to let them know, hey, I don't just do rock or pop, I also do orchestral and dubstep and um, corporate advertising and folk music and indie to kind of say like, I can be everything for everything that you guys need. I am a team player and I'm here to basically cover all bases, whatever you need, okay? Uh, to create value for the library by submitting tracks that serve a particular need. So basically you would be <clears throat> crafting an email they're basically showing them, hey, I understand you guys have some specific needs, or at least I'm perceiving that you guys might have these specific needs based on what I've researched. And I want to give you tracks that basically serve that specific need. So let's say you looked at their catalog, you noticed that their EDM uh, number of tracks was kind of lacking, or their EDM songs sound a little bit dated, kind of, you know, in the 90s or something. And you said, hey, I can really update your EDM catalog. Here's some specific tracks to help do that for you. Um, and E, the last option, is to establish a personal friendship with the library's employees. So basically just to try to be as friendly as possible, to try to say that you're open to maybe even flying out or driving out to meet them wherever they are, and just trying to show more of a personal approach to it, not just business, um, so that you don't like maybe scare them off or something like that. So I don't know if this is tough or this is easy for some of you. I know some of you probably already have the right answer, but I tried to, I'm going to try to reveal these uh, in not an obvious way where one of them obviously sounds like the right answer because some of these actually aren't terrible and some of these actually I think you could also include. But again, this question was, what's, what should be your main objective? What's the main thing that you should be bringing out in your first submission to a library? And the answer is D, to create value for the library by submitting tracks that serve a particular a need, okay? By doing this, you actually kind of solve some of the other issues. So by doing this, you first are basically solving B, that you are demonstrating you understand the business because you're understanding the only, the only thing that matters to them, which is what their needs are, what their clients are wanting, or maybe something that their catalog is lacking. You're coming in and solving a problem for them. Again, coming with a solution, super powerful. And you're, you're demonstrating that you do understand some really fundamental business stuff because you're going in there, not just talking about yourself. They don't really need to know your personal history for the last five or 10 years. That's not interesting and relevant to what their needs are, right? You're here to serve their needs. Um, you're not gonna uh, submit a wide variety of musical styles because usually to get into a library, you need to become their go-to person for a particular one, maybe two genres, okay? So if you love rock and maybe pop music, maybe you can dabble with those two, but you really should become their sort of go-to rock guy or girl or orchestral or whatever. That's how I got into libraries in the beginning. I was the rock sort of slash hip hop guy. Um, mostly I was doing hybrid rock hip hop, but then eventually it was just like just rock and that's really where I got started. And then I started opening up some new um, opportunities with libraries and uh, I said, hey, I'm a rock producer. Do you need some rock? And they said, no, but do you have anything like in the adult contemporary world? We need some kind of soft pop rock music. Maybe you could do something like that. And so I said, great, I do have some you know, examples of what I've done in the past. And that became my identity with this new library because they didn't need more rock guys. They had plenty of rock guys on their catalog, on their roster. So you need to sort of niche into one particular sound that can really 
get you as their go-to rock or pop or EDM person, right, on their catalog. And you're not there to establish a friendship with these, co these companies and catalogs. You can be friendly, we can all be fun, we can even get together and have dinners and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, though, our relationships with the companies and music supervisors is business. We're here to uh, you know, serve uh, the needs and the demands of various clients, and we're here to make money. At the, be at the base end of all of this stuff, we are here in this business to get placements, to get royalties, okay? So be friendly, be jovial, you know, be a, be a likable person. That is very, very important, but that's not the primary reason why we're, we're getting in touch with these companies. We need to make sure that we are making money for each other, okay? That's the primary, that's the fundamental of what our relationships are. So hopefully that was a little bit fun, right? Let's go to the next one. You want to collaborate with a producer on a track. How should you approach them? So say you write lyrics, you're, you're just a, a songwriter, but you don't actually know how to produce. You don't have any DAW experience. You don't have a computer maybe to produce or you just don't have the software or the knowledge to make music. How do you go finding a producer and how do you approach them when you find one uh, to help you make music? Uh, a, tell them you've been passed up so many times by other producers in the past that you deserve a shot, okay? So just letting them know that you've got talent, but like nobody else wants to give them any time of day. And you really deserve sort of a shot at putting your ideas on, on in a DAW with a producer because you think they've got a lot of um, potential. B, offer a specific musical service that can make their job easier, and this being the producer's job easier. So saying like, hey, uh, you know, I can understand that there is a sort of library that wants this kind of vocal music. I notice that you have some incredible instrumental tracks. If you're open to partnering with me, I can basically help you get vocals on your tracks and then we can submit them and get accepted into a library that neither one of us by ourselves probably could have gotten involved in. So basically you're giving a sort of specific pitch for a specific um, opportunity in front of you. Uh, C, offer to buy him a coffee or a meal to butter him up. Can't hurt, right? Saying like, hey, let's go, you know, I'll, get, I'll take you to Red Lobster. Um, please, like just let me work with you. I really need a producer. Uh, D, show off, show off your past accomplishments and accolades. So like if you had some uh, awards or you have a big following, um, you know, just something that kind of just boosts you up as a really credible person, as a vocalist, maybe send them that stuff to kind of just get them excited about working with you because maybe they can get some exposure, right, if you have something to offer there. Uh, and E, just beg them. Just completely get on your knees and just say, please, please give me a shot and please help me produce music. I'll do anything, right? This one probably is a little more obvious. I would guess you guys know this one. It is B, offer a specific music service, musical service that can make their job easier. Always, again, with these answers, usually what you're looking for is thinking about their perspective. What is it that they need? What is it that they want? And coming to them to the table and saying, hey, if you ever have needs for vocal work or I have a particular idea for how to get into a library and here's my idea, Again, you're coming to the table with a complete project, with a vision, with a solution, not just a, you know, please, sir, give me some work. I would really love some work, just begging for work. It's not attractive. Nobody wants to be around somebody who's begging. It's not a good way to go. But you could come to the table and you're like, I've got an idea and I've got a solution. I've already got it mapped out and here's how we can do it. And I can even maybe record my own vocals. You just send me the stems and I can record the vocals from my house. That's even making their job way easier. So they don't have to worry about mixing your vocals and, and recording your vocals and all that good stuff. So come to the table with a solution and you'll see that you'll get much better results that way. All right, number three, you promised the library that you can deliver 12 tracks in a month, but at the deadline, the end of the month comes, you only have six completed. What do you do? Happens a lot in this business. People over promising, saying, sure, no problem, I'll get you 12 tracks. The deadline comes, they have 10, they have eight, or maybe just 11, they don't, even, they don't have the 12. And you might be thinking, does that really matter? I mean, 11 out of 12 ain't bad. How important is your words? In some ways, I believe your word is the most important, valuable resource that you have. So if you're coming to the table doing business deals with people and they know that like, yeah, they say they get, they'll get 12, but they really only get 11, that's not a good reputation to have, right? It's just off by one, right? But delivering 14 instead of 12 on time, you see the difference between that, like how they're gonna view you? It really matters if you say you're gonna do something that you deliver or over deliver. So A, explain to them, you know, call them up, email them why you weren't able to finish the full album. Let them know, right? Having a little backstory, you know, your, your kid got sick, your car broke down, your, you know, you had to work extra shifts at, at your job, whatever it was. Just give them a little bit of backstory to let them understand what it is that prevented you from getting it done on time. Might help give, give you some leniency. Uh, B, just crankly, quickly crank out 12, uh, six tracks to complete the album. So 
you, yeah, it might be just in two days, you gotta get this thing done, but just whatever, just throw something together. It's better to have 12 than to give, let's say, uh, six tracks that are completed. Uh, just give whatever, get a whole bunch of uh, maybe um, you know loops or something like that and just throw together whatever, something that follows close enough to what the first six are. So at least you give them the 12, so you meet that expectation. C, just finish the six tracks uh, to another library that can uh, accept them. So rather than even sending these six tracks to this library, just find another library that's cool with you just giving them six, right? So they're not expecting 12 from you. So just go find another library, say, hey, I got these six tracks, would you like them? And then whatever, you know, you can finish the 12 with this library later or just not even do anything with them. Uh, just don't say anything, Don't you don't wanna bother them. Uh, just submit them when they're ready, okay? So even though the end of the month has come, it might take you a couple of weeks, but you don't wanna bother them with, uh, you know, hey, I need some more time or whatever. Just don't, don't bother them, just submit it in a couple of weeks or whenever you get those final six done. And, D, and E, uh, just deliver what's finished, those six tracks, and ask for an extension on the remaining six tracks. Probably a little obvious on this one as well. That one would be E. You just need to give them what you've got, okay? It's not a good thing that you only delivered half. That is really not a good thing. But considering you're in the situation now, you can't do anything about it right now because you're at that deadline. Give them what you've got. If you've got six tracks ready to go, or even if you haven't bounced the finals and the stems that they need, just do that. Just get those six out to them and send it in a zip file in one email and also in the email say, I apologize, I have not completed the full 12 tracks that I knew I said that I was going to. You do acknowledge that you did not meet what you said you did. Don't just play dumb like, ah, oh, you know, and I'll have those new, I'll have those other six in two weeks. Don't try to pre pretend and be cute with it. Just own it. The fact that you did not get the deadline done, own that, admit that, and just say, I will, I will get these done for you in two weeks or three weeks. And be honest with yourself. How long is it really going to take to finish out the album? And don't you dare miss that next uh, um, deadline. If you miss that next deadline, your reputation is really shot with this library. I mean, it's already hitting, taking a kind of a hit when you didn't meet, meet the first one, but um, you can salvage a bit by saying, here's what I've got. I apologize for the delay. Don't give them excuses. They don't need to know why it's not done. It's just not done, right? That's all that matters to them. They don't have 12 tracks. Just let them know it was not completed. I apologize. I will need an additional two weeks to complete these six tracks. Thank you so much for your patience. Let me know if this is going to be a problem, okay? Got to own it and you got to put in your, your own deadline for the next one. All right, let's move on. You have to deliver stems and bounces to a music supervisor for a project that you're working on, but you're having at the last minute huge technical problems. Your DAW isn't working. One of your plugins isn't loading up. Your computer won't even turn on. Your external hard drive broke on you. You can't get to the session. You can't bounce the, the things you need to do. You can't deliver what you need to on, on time. What do you do? Oh man, I've been in this situation it's panic mode. It really sucks. And it, sometimes these things always seem to happen at the worst possible time. And I don't know how that is. Maybe we just remember the times where things just really went astray uh, when we really didn't need them to do that. So A, uh, email tech support, wh wh whoever, you know, if it's your DAW or your external hard drive, email the company. And then once you get that information, just forward that email exchange to the supervisor so that they're just kind of kept in the loop as to what's happening with your tech issues. So they know you're not making it up, you're not lying. They can read for themselves your back and forth with tech support about what's happening with your DAW or whatever your tech issue is. Um, B, don't bother the supervisor with this stuff and just send the files when they're ready, okay? Don't even let them know. If you need to send them a, a day or two late, just do that. But you don't wanna keep bother them and pestering them with stuff that they don't really need to be kept informed of, okay? Um, email the supervisor and ask for an extension on the deadline. Just let them know, hey, this is what's happening. I have a tech issue and I'm working on it. Um, and I am, I am going to need an ex extension on the deadline to get these uh, sessions, these files to you, the stems, the bounces, whatever it is they need, okay? Uh, D, just send the entire session file. Like if you're using Logic or, or Pro Tools, just send the whole file to them, zip it up so that they can bounce the tracks on their, on their computer and whatever their system is. They can probably open it up and do the work that you're not able to do um, from your home studio. Or E, just go buy new software, or if you have to, maybe a new computer to get past the technical issue or a hard drive or whatever it was. Um, if you can go buy a new piece of software or hardware or a computer to get past it, just go do that real quick. Maybe you can return it afterwards, whatever, to get through it. All right, correct answer here, C. As usual, you're starting to see the pattern. Direct, clear communication. Email the supervisor and ask for an extension on the deadline. Uh, a, no. Uh, I've actually had this happen where one, one producer who was sending tracks to me started forwarding me emails from their tech support from some company 
and I said, please stop sending me your tech support emails. I'm not interested in that. You know what I want? I want files. I want final stems, final bounces. I don't want a back and forth from your tech support. It's really spamming people to like, to, I, why do I care about that? All I know is that I need your files and I don't have them. And that's all a library is going to think. I don't know why you're not giving me your files and I don't need to see the back and forth between you and tech support. Just let me know when I can get them, right? So that's why we talk about we don't want to over communicate, send them information they don't need to have. That's why A is not a good um, choice. B, going silent and not even talking to them about it. No, don't keep people in the dark. You need to let them know you're having an issue and that you're going to need an extension, okay? Uh, D, saying the entire session and telling them to do the work. You're creating homework for them. You're creating a problem for them, okay? Do not do that. If you do email and let them ask for extension on the deadline, you can suggest that to say like, if you need these right away and you're open to it, I can send you this and that. Again, you're always offering the solutions for how to get past the problem, but it needs to come along with a sort of clear direct request for an extension in order to solve your problem, however long you feel it's gonna to take to solve the issue that you have. Um, and just buying new software or computer, you know, sometimes that's the way to go. I've definitely had to do that in the past where um, I might, I don't remember what it was, but I might have had to go, uh, sorry, uh, buy a new plugin or instance of a plugin or something like that to just get past the issue I was having or more a, a USB plug. If it's something simple like that for sure, but going out and buying a brand new computer or some new software or something just to get past this thing, it's usually not the way to go. Um, you're going to be wasting a lot of money and sometimes you can't get refunds on software if it's been downloaded. So you're going to be wasting a lot of money doing that kind of thing. So I don't think that's the smart way to go about it. All right, next up, you discover some of your tracks submitted to a library. Let's say you get accepted and you've submitted some tracks. They haven't been registered though. They're not showing up on BMI or ASCAP's, uh, ASCAP's um, website um, and it's been over 30 days. And that's usually 30 to 60 days is usually what you should give a library to get your stuff up. But let's say it's been past 30 days, you're still not seeing it show up and you're getting a little worried because you're like, are my tracks gonna get registered? Am I gonna earn royalties? What do you do? Okay, good stuff and a really very, very, very common situation you probably will come across in this business. A, call the library, get their phone number and demand to talk to the owner or the CEO just to make sure you haven't been forgotten, that your track's not sitting on the sidelines or got trashed or something like that. Get on the phone, you gotta talk to people um, to make sure that they're you know aware of what's going on here, okay? B, email the library and ask them to clarify the registration process for submitted tracks. So some libraries, they batch all the registrations at the end of one month or at the end of two months. Uh, they don't usually every single day when they get new tracks go, okay, let's go register, let's go register. Usually some, it's very common that some libraries will gather, let's say eight albums and then at the end of the month or the end of two months, they'll go do a batch, a massive batch of registrations with, PR, with uh, BMI or ASCAP or CSAC or maybe an international PRO. Uh, don't bother the library with this kind of stuff. This is the third option. Uh, the tracks will usually always eventually show up. So it's like, stop worrying about it. Don't even talk to them. Don't even email them or bother them with a phone call. Just just be assured your tracks will eventually be there. D, uh, just stop working with them. Stop submitting to the library because maybe you've lost some confidence in them and you just should stop working with them because they, maybe they are just sitting on your, your tracks. Um, or E, call or email your PRO. So ASCAP, BMI, CSAC and ask them why your tracks aren't showing up. Maybe they can give you some sort of insights as to why you've submitted tracks to their library and they're not showing up on, um, on their end. And this one, of course, email the library and ask them to clarify the registration process, okay? You're not coming calling to them and demanding and accusing them and saying, you guys are sitting on my, uh, my tracks and this is unacceptable and I can't believe this and I should have had my stuff registered. You gotta understand that this is a slow moving business. Again, it takes six to nine months for your ro royalties to get even um, paid out to you. And so it can take a long time also for your tracks to be registered and updated and ingested into the system. I've worked with all kinds of, ca of libraries, some that get it done in, in a week or two, super fast, others that takes three months, it takes four months to finally get the tracks registered. And it sucks and it's really frustrating because you do have to continuously check on your registration online in your catalog to make sure that they're showing up in your account but you can't pressure people to do things if they're doing it in a way that works for them. For the, They have a system, they probably have a way to have their employees do these registrations and they're doing it in the most effective way that works for them. So rather than coming to them and accusing them and, and being really um, aggressive and, and belligerent about it, just ask them to clarify, hey, you know, I've noticed my tracks haven't shown up. Can you let me know what the registration timeline is? What's the process that we're, just let me know what my expectations can be when I submit tracks so that I know how often things get registered, 
Um, and also the other thing you guys need to be aware of is that PROs can take a while to get your tracks. Even though let's say a library submits the registrations, it can take, I, mean, I know that ASCAP and BMI at various times in the year, they've got backlogs that last for a month, right? Two, two weeks to a month where they have so many tracks to get through to finally process them that it takes a long time for them to show up. So definitely don't panic. You're not gonna be missing out on royalties or anything like that but getting the updated uh, registration process can take some time, okay? So if the library says, uh, you know, we've registered them and we don't know, you know, we registered them, let's say a month ago and we don't know what's going on, then you can definitely do E. You can call the PRO, BMI ASCAP, whoever's yours is, and ask them, hey, you know, my library registered my tracks about a month ago. Is there a backlog? Can you let me know what the, what's going on in the registration process? They should be able to give you an answer and let you know, like, yes, we're totally backed up, but don't worry, we will get to everybody's tracks. And that can give you just sort of a peace of mind. But um, you shouldn't just be assuming that um, they will just show up, though. So uh, you should always be double checking your registrations to make sure the tracks you do submit to libraries always show up. So that's why C is not the right uh, answer. A, no, that's not a reason to be calling the library and bothering the CEO because this is a very common thing. It's a slow process. You might not just be aware of it because you are not, you haven't been in the business long enough, but bothering the CEO for this kind of stuff will drive them up the wall. They get these kind of requests and, and demands all the time. So don't do that. Just email them. Okay, it's not an emergency. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to have a phone call for it. Um, and definitely not D, like to just stop submitting to the library because they might be getting you placements, they might be getting you some great stuff and they have some great relationships and then you just assume, again, that they're doing bad things and they're just sitting on your tracks or not registering them and you give up the relationship and then you've soured a really good thing. So that's why D is not the right answer. So I think this is the last one here and then we'll, we'll wrap this one up, guys. Uh, so you've emailed a library or supervisor that you've been accepted to, okay? but you haven't received a, sp a response in a week. So this isn't you submitting for the first time. You've already been accepted. You've got a relationship started. Maybe you've been on the phone. Maybe you just emailed and you sent them an email with some questions, with some requests, and they just didn't get back to you. And it's been about a week. Happens to me, happens to everybody in this business. It's super frustrating. I can tell you that it's not easy. Um, but what do you do? Like, what's your course of action when that hits? Okay. A again, call the library as usual and demand to talk to the owner or the CEO. B, just stop working with the library because they're ignoring you. So maybe they're not people that you should be working with. Uh, C, email them again and remind them that the behavior is unprofessional. Let them know that you don't appreciate being ignored and being sat on, okay? They obviously read your email and so they should be getting back to you and so you don't appreciate that. Uh, D, email them again and politely ask if they received the previous email, also including it in your email. So the one you sent a week ago, Copy and paste that, put it back in the email, and on the very top say, hey guys, just wanted to make sure you received this email. I haven't heard back from you yet. Did you receive this? And actually give the email that you had sent with your questions or requests or whatever it was. And E, just send the same email again, right? So without sort of explanation as to why you're sending them again, just go back to your inbox, forward it, and forward it to them again. Should be fairly obvious that this one obviously is D. Email them and politely ask if they received your previous email. It's possible it got slipped into the spam folder. It's possible that they had a crazy week, they were traveling, there was a trade show that they were traveling all over the place for. They had a lot of gigs, they had a lot of opportunities, they're in a bunch of meetings. It happens, guys. We all get busy. We all sometimes can't get to our email uh, right away, okay? Don't call the library bothering them. That's over communicating. That's really getting on their nerves that they're having just a busy week, okay? Stop working with the library. I, if I stopped working with libraries, they didn't get back to me in a week, I would have no libraries at all. I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, there are just times when they get busy and they either didn't see your email or maybe they read it like at nine o'clock at night and then they went to bed. The next day they come back to their email inbox and they don't see that you're, you have a new email so they just forget about your email. I do it too. I get tons of emails every single day and I don't always remember everybody's email and get back to everybody okay so i do the best that i can but i'm a human being things slip through the cracks okay um emailing again and you know accusing them that they're unprofessional obviously no uh, and just sending the same email again without any sort of explanation as to why you're sending it again nah it's not the strongest way to go about it you should just ask them maybe that you know it got ca caught in their spam or maybe they just didn't see it always just again don't accuse don't assume you just ask them, did you receive my previous email? Here it is. I still had some questions. I needed to get these answers. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's summarize. What did we learn today? Be direct. Okay. Ask for what you want directly. Don't be aggressive. Don't demand things. But if you want something, if you're in need of something, just be direct with it. And also, if you're in a situation where you're not, a great, not in a great place, you got tech issues, you can't deliver on time, you're, you're not going to be able to meet the demands, 
be direct about it. Don't go don't go silent on people. Don't make an ex don't make excuses. Don't you know, like fail to acknowledge the fact that you're not delivering on time. You got to be direct with this stuff. Direct communication is a winning strategy. It always will keep you in the clear. Even if you're not um, you know, like again, if you if you miss the deadline, you're not in a great situation, but the only way to save yourself is to be direct and own it and admit it and say, yep, I screwed up. I didn't get this on time. I apologize. I need an extension on the deadline and I will deliver to you on time. Got to be direct like that. Do not be passive aggressive. Okay. I've harped on this so many times on this channel. I'm not going to do it here. Have the confidence also to know what information you deserve to know. Okay. So if you're asking about your registrations and the library hasn't responded to you in a week, you send a follow-up email and I still don't get back to you, you need to know that you're not bothering them to find out, hey, are my tracks being registered? That's not something that you're being a pest about. That's something that you do deserve to know. If I'm sending you guys tracks, are these tracks even getting registered? Are they going into the system? Am I gonna potentially even get paid for this kind of music? So there are some things that you deserve to know and you deserve to be assertive about and to demand that you get those answers for, okay? But there are also other things where you don't need to be as, uh, uh, you know, as on it that, that um, uh, how would I describe that? So, you know, always hitting them up every other day and saying, hey, what are you guys working on? Who are your clients? What's this? What's that? And you're kind of thinking that you deserve to know what's going on in their inner workings of their, their catalog. No, that's not what you need to know. You do need to ask them what are their current needs, what kind of music can they possibly use, right? Always be having that dialogue, but you don't need to know how they're running their business, their rates, their this and that. That, that the, None of that needs to be um, applicable for you. What you do need to know is how you can best serve them. What kind of music can they possibly use that can get their clients the most um, value in the placements that they're working with, okay? Be polite, okay? Don't, don't be rude. Never accuse, blame, or attack your business partners. Even if something is really weird looking and you're not seeing your registrations and you're even missing royalties, never assume, first of all, that somebody's stealing from you or somebody's screwing you over, okay? When you start doing that, you put yourself in a really bad situation and they're usually, if you're wrong, you really make the wrong first step to try to correct that situation. So always go with the, give everybody the benefit of the doubt that it was a misstep, it was an error, it was just an oversight. Always offer a solution instead of just coming to the table with problems. Always offer a way to correct it, to figure out how to get past the issue rather than coming to the board or coming to the table with a complaint or a problem or this or that. Always have something that can solve the problem because you will definitely be valuable, much more valuable when you are the one coming up with the solutions. And always remember just a fundamental truth about human beings that people like being around nice, cool people. If you're, if you think you deserve things, if you think you, um, you, you're owed something, like you, uh, you're entitled to something, um, and you have that sort of just sort of chip on your shoulder, nobody wants to be around you. Nobody's going to work with you, including, especially including people that are going to want to work, with, have to work with you, month in and month out, year in and year out. You know, all all these years in the licensing business. Um, I work with people in this business that are cool, that I like, and vice versa. They like me. Uh, you got to have that really just nice, cool, chill, approachable personality, okay? Um, if you're being demanding, if you think you, you deserve stuff and you think that you, you should be somewhere that you're not, boring, not interesting, sorry, there's, there's too many other people that are cool and humble that I'd rather work with than somebody like that. Be hungry, okay? This is a really, really important part and this is why I'm landing and ending this presentation with this point. You are owed nothing. Nothing is owed to you. Earn your keep, okay? Take the small gigs, even if it's small, even if it doesn't pay much and it's not a big market and it's just a, a tiny little uh, market that you're gonna be licensing to. Take those gigs from your partner so that when the big ones come, guess who they're gonna offer it to? It's gonna be you. You're gonna be the one that always took the gigs, always helped out, always wanted to offer your services, even when the, the, pun, the money wasn't that great, even when the opportunity wasn't that lucrative or sexy, because you're showing that you're a team player, you're here to work, you're the hungriest producer on their roster. Um, it says so much about you, and it, and it really leaves a really great taste in the mouth of your licensing partners, your music supervisors, or libraries that you work with, because they know, hey, you know, Joe, he's the guy that always gives, he always delivers for us. Even if it's a small little gig, he's always available, he always gives us something. Even if it's something he doesn't even know he's that great at, he always gives us a shot, and so he's always coming to bat for us. We want to go to bat for him. When we get that big $5,000, $10,000 custom cue, or even bigger, we're going to Joe. Joe is our guy. That's why you, you got to be the hungriest producer. You can't just sit there and sit on your high horse and like, mm, 
that's too little. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not going to go down to that level to you know use my talents. I'm I'm above that. I, guys, I'm doing this full time, ten years. I almost never say no to anything that I get offered, even if it's a really small gig, not that much money. I'm I'm not too big for anything, right? If I can't do it myself, I try to farm it out to maybe syndicate members or another producer that I know. But I try to offer a solution to everybody that comes to me for music because it's so rare to meet people and, and be in the position that I'm in to have these kind of relationships that people are paying me to do music. Why would you ever say no to somebody wanting to pay to put money in your pocket for you doing what you love doing, being a creative, passionate person? So, you know, you got sometimes you got to put yourself on check, realize where you are in the business and take every gig you possibly can get. And another sort of just fundamental truth, hardworking people like to be around other hard working people. I love being surrounded by and working with people that are hustling just as hard as I am. Nobody likes to be the Michael Jordan on the team and having all of these just lazy people on the bench with them who don't, you know, work as hard and don't practice as hard and just sort of ride the coattails of Michael Jordan. Nobody likes that, okay? Michael Jordan wants to be around people who work as hard as him, practice as hard as him, are dedicated as much as he is. So people in the licensing business are hard workers. We work super hard. So be one of us, right? Be a hardworking producer. People will notice that and they will want to work with you. So that's it, guys. Those are my communication skills. We kind of also touched into a couple of other things, but really it's just about like, you know, your mindset, your business mindset. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. It was kind of fun with the, uh, with the quiz there. You guys could kind of see essentially even when you have new scenarios that come into place that I didn't even touch on, you should now kind of have a clear idea of what kind of solutions and what kind of communication skills you should be using to make sure that you win in the music licensing business. If you found this useful, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video with a producer, a songwriter, anybody who's trying to get involved in the music licensing industry.